the epic casebook. In which Inspector Carr investigates. Good evening. You may have read that there arrived in South Africa recently a leading member of Scotland Yard for consultations concerning a trial which cannot be commented upon at this stage. I remembered him as a young constable who was present at one of the most sensational murder trials ever to take place. It was the culmination of my investigation into the death of a well-known member of the underworld, Lawrence Ritchie. I've called my story Murder on the Brain. When news came through that Larry Ritchie was found on Clapham Common with a 3-8 bullet in his head, I was neither surprised nor, it must be said, perturbed. Do you say operations that Ritchie was found ten minutes ago? Yes, sir. He was recognized at once by Sergeant Wood at the Clapham Manor, and he thought the squad should be informed. Quite right. Looks like gang warfare. Some other thug belonging to some other gang will want his revenge. It looks as though we're going to have a busy time. Where's the body? At Clapham Mortuary, sir. Has the murder weapon been found? No, sir. All right, I'll send Sergeant Jackson out. Uh, have the local boys found anything, do you know? If they have, they haven't reported it, Inspector. All right, thank you. Now, here's the file on the Wilson case you wanted, sir. Thanks, Jackson. Oh, you'd better put it in the pending file. Something more urgent's cropped up. Oh, no, sir? Remember Larry Ritchie, the one that went in for grievous bodily harm? <laughs> do I, sir? I gave evidence. Uh, do you see that file from X-Branch? They say he's now working with the Lambeth mob. Was, past tense. He's uh, dead. Murdered. Well, he certainly had it coming to him, sir, didn't he? He certainly had. I still believe he's the man who bumped off light-fingered Morris. Shot with a 3-8. That'll cause a rumpus, won't it, sir? <clears throat> certainly will. If we don't find the killer, and fast, the metropolitan area will become a shooting target for every light-fingered, trick-a-happy thug. All right, Jackson. Ops has got the location. Clapham Common. They're expecting you. Go out there and see if there's anything the local boys have missed. Right, sir. I'll get hold of Dr. McPherson and take a look at the body. Accompanied by the senior police surgeon, I went over to the mortuary to take a look at the lifeless body of the man who had caused us so much trouble and worry in the past. Even in death, his features could not be robbed of their coarse brutality. Ugly-looking customer, isn't he, Mac? He certainly is. Hmm. All those powder marks. I, uh, he was shot at close quarters, all right. Right through the temple. Uh, take a look at the wound, Inspector. You see how easy it was to extricate the bullet. Hmm. Well, what does that mean, Mac? Well, without going into the gruesome details, the gun was so close to the forehead as to cause a tremendously wide hole in the bone structure... I doubt if the gun was more than an inch from the man's forehead. When did he die? Well, I understand that the temperature last night was pretty moderate. I would say that he was shot somewhere around about one o'clock this morning. Uh, by the way, uh, here's the bullet. The local sergeant handed it to me. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I'll send it over to ballistics, but I don't think it'll do us much good. If it was a gang killing, the weapon's sure to be stolen. Hey, true enough. I wonder what he was doing in the common at that time of the morning. Somebody lured him there. Aye. Somebody he knew, obviously. He wouldn't have allowed anyone to be so close unless it was someone he knew. An ideal rendezvous for a killing. Clapham Common's still one of the few lungs of London that isn't enclosed with railings and gates, except for the northern sector. Mm, you're looking a bit uh, despondent. Oh, wouldn't you be, Mac? My suspects are the hundreds of mobsters in the underworld. It means thousands of questions, dozens of foot-slogging constables getting all those informers on the job. Oh, well, it's no good moaning. Back into the fray. I wasn't exaggerating. 
every available man in plain clothes was detailed to mingle with the regulars at every known haunt of the gamblers, the mobsters, even the petty thieves. In the meantime, the murder squad got busy on the higher level. Blimey, look who's here. Ah, oh, shut up. Hello, Inspector Cohen. Hello, Lofty. Do you want to talk here? Oh, well, let's use the manager's office. Here, take my cue, Bill. Right. You're uh, on the wrong track, Inspector. I'll be the judge of that. Seen the papers? Yeah, the recent edition of a messenger. Said he was found shot through the head on Clapham Common. Here, do you. Now, sit down, won't you? All right. A cigarette? Let's not be polite to each other. I hate your guts, you hate mine. Hate me enough to frame me? Oh, you know better than that. Lofty, one of our informers tells us that he witnessed a little scene between you and Larry Ritchie at the Cock and Sparrow. Oh, so what? He had it coming to him. I dressed him down a little. I told him to stop getting into my air, that's all. All right. You tell me what happened. Well, I received information that this two-bit punk was getting ideas above his station, so, uh... I went over to the cock and sparrow where I knew he'd be. So I said to this bookie, I'll bet Tiger's eye for five quid. At ten to one, you owe me fifty quid. And he says to me, where's your ticket? <laughs> and I says to him, I haven't got a ticket. But I've got a nice knuckle duster to dust you down with. And he says to me, oh, so you lost your ticket, did you? Well, here's your money. <laughs> I then says to him, I look like having that ten to one winner every Saturday. <laughs> oh. What are you talking about, my friend Harry Blake? Now listen, Lofty. <laughs> well, tough guy. Don't you like having your face slapped? You can't do this to me. Oh, that's funny. I thought I could. Like this. No, oh, no. <laughs> Tony, I think some of these gentlemen don't like the way I'm treating their friend. Now, look, we ain't got nothing to do with it. Now, look, this is only the hors d'oeuvre, so to speak. You try running an agency in Notting Hill, and you'll find yourself in the bottom of a sewer where you belong. And you can tell your boss, Simmy, I said so. I see. Shimmy Evans? Yeah. You're too smart to start a killing in the top league. You bumped off Larry Ritchie as another hors d'oeuvre. It was warning the head of the Lambeth mob to stay in their own preserve, hmm? Now, look, I've been expecting it. Now, I know what you think, Inspector. It isn't true. That was enough warning for Shimmy. The pasting I gave Larry. Do you think that Shimmy Evans is going to take this lying down? Did you do it yourself? Look, Judd, I'm warning you... Look, that... I'm as surprised at this as you are. Now, why should I get him bumped off? What happened at the Cock and Sparrow was only two days ago. Why shouldn't I have bumped him off then? Or arranged for someone else to do it? Ah, you know better than that. Killing's not my line, is isn't it? Isn't it, isn't it? I'll tell you this. If it is, the Notting Hill boys are going to be looking for a new leader very soon. Over the years, a senior police official learns never to discount his hunches. My hunch was that Judd was telling the truth, that in fact his look of concern and anxiety over Larry Ritchie's killing was genuine. I thought I'd better have a word with the leader of the Lambeth mob. What do you want with me, Inspector? Take that holier-than-thou look off your face. Didn't you expect a visit from the murder squad? Don't you read your papers? Aren't your gambling dens humming with the news of Larry Ritchie's slaying? Well, of course they are, but why come to me? One of your boys will have told you what happened at the Cock and Sparrow. Lofty Judd doesn't work over one of my boys and get away with it. I don't mind telling you that we were going to do a little uh, dusting down ourselves. We were going to pay a call on one of the Notting Hill mob. I know. Well, things are too hot. But if you don't send Lofty Judd for the big drop, we'll do it ourselves. Come on, Shimmy. Are you telling me, a police officer, that you intend to take the law into your own hands? Come on, Bill Inspector. This is too serious. What you mean is that if Larry's killing isn't avenged, your gang will think you're yellow. Now, let me tell you something. Judd wasn't responsible for Richie's death. Ah, come off it. Look, Inspector, you and I know each other. I'm not threatening to kill anyone. I'm too smart to think that I wouldn't get away with it. But something will happen to Mr. I and mighty lofty Judd. You know, uh, an accident. Won't be anybody's fault but his own. And no one will be able to say the Lambeth boys were concerned in it. Is that a threat? 
No. It's a fact. What does he want to go kill him for? Do you know that not one of my boys has ever carried a rod? I think I ought to warn you that I am still a police officer, you know. I know, I know. It's your murder squad. Listen to me, Shimmy, and take heed of what I tell you. I don't want any violence while this murder investigation is going on. I need every plainclothes man I can get. You start anything that weakens my investigation and you won't know what's hit you. Uh, you've been funny, Inspector. Weaken your investigation? Larry was my pal. Shimmy. Supposing I give you my word that I am convinced that the Notting Hill boys had nothing to do with the shooting of Larry Ritchie. Would you accept it? Yes, I would. Huh? And I'll do a deal with you. No monkey business. Tell your boys there are to be no skirmishes with the Notting Hill gang. None at all. And if anything comes to light proving me wrong, you will be the first to know. Fair enough? Well, you got my hand on it, shake. You misunderstand my attitude. I want to avoid a shooting war and I want to find the killer of Larry Ritchie, but I don't shake hands with bullies, thugs and racketeers. Good day to you. Darling, have you seen the paper? Hello? Larry Ritchie's been bumped off. Huh? Am I, uh, interrupting something? I'm just leaving. Aren't you going to introduce me? Oh, what for? Don't you recognize a cop when you see one? Cop? Inspector Carl, murder squad, New Scotland Yard. Oh, have you come about Larry? Well, I'll tell you who killed him. That swine, lofty judge. Amazing, you keep out of it. Why should I? Larry was as much my friend as yours. Your friend, was he? Do you mind telling me your name, madam? Ah, uh, didn't you know? Go on, Shimmy. Tell him who I am. This is my wife, Maisie. How do you do, Mrs. Evans? Oh, dear. I hope this isn't going to start something. The less you say, the better. You remembered your promise? Ah, oh, don't worry. There ain't going to be no trouble. Trouble? What trouble? Inspector Carr's given me his word that he doesn't think the Notting Hill mob had anything to do with Larry's killing. But it says in the paper that he was found shot in the head on Clapham Common early this morning. Ah! Uh, duck! Uh, it's all right, it's all right. No need to duck. It's a brick. It's a message. Piece of paper tied to it. Shouldn't be surprised if it wasn't a message from the Notting Hill mob. It was obvious from the white blood-drained faces of Mr. and Mrs. Evans that they expected something much more lethal than a brick being hurled. I bent down and picked up the missile. Well, let's see what this says. Hmm. We did not bump off Larry, Richie. Don't start anything you might be sorry for. Huh. Still think Lofty Judd was responsible? Oh, I don't know what to think. It's easy for him to write a note like that. Every killer says he didn't do it. Seems you're not versed in the etiquette of gang warfare, Mrs. Evans. When one gang causes damage to the member of another, it usually is a challenge. There's nothing challenging about that note, is there? Oh, that's true. The two of you must be mad. Who else would bump him over? Who else had reason to? If I may point out to you, madam, it was your husband's gang which trespassed on the Notting Hill territory. Judd... Don't tell me about Judd. He's a killer. Can't you see? I'm scared stiff for Shimmy. If you don't put him beyond bars, what's going to happen to my husband? Nothing. If your husband is innocent. was he? There could have been a dozen hidden motives, motives divorced from the obvious run of gang reprisals. Messages came pouring into the yard from our placed plainclothes men and informers, telling of the seething excitement in the underworld at the possible repercussions. What were the big boys going to do? Was Larry's death about to trigger off a new wave of lawlessness? I was thankful that as the hours and the days passed, there was every indication that Evans and Judd had kept their mobs in check. And during this time, the exasperatingly slow gathering together of all the threads to make a pattern was taking place. Oh, what do you think of Judd's alibi, Jackson? Uh, not very good, is it, sir? No. There's only his wife willing to swear that he was home in bed when the shooting took place. True. But he didn't do it. I'm convinced that neither he nor any of his lieutenants were responsible. But somebody did it, sir. Of course somebody did it. <sighs> Sorry, Jackson. 
This thing's getting me down. Reams and reams of paper checking on the movements of every possible suspect. Look at this. There are 24 people willing to swear to seeing Shimmy Evans at the Cock and Sparrow between the hours of 1 and 3 on the morning of the 27th. At least four of them have unimpeachable characters. Yes. We seem to be getting nowhere fast, to use your phrase. That's true. What was he doing on the common? Thug like that's usually at a spieler, or... Here, wait a minute. Why wasn't he at the Cock and Sparrow with the rest of the gang? I think I'll have another word with our friend Shimmy. Tell me, Shimmy, I want the truth. And I promise it won't go beyond these four walls. Was Larry on a job for you? Now, don't no. give me that holier-than-thou look again. If you're genuine about wanting his murder revenge, you'll come clean. What was he doing on the common? Was he on a breaking and entering job, one of the big houses, Clapham Way? Come on, Bill Inspector, breaking and entering? Do you think he'd go for small stuff like that? No, he came to me and asked me whether I was going to be at the Cock and Sparrow, and I said yes. Well, he then said that he wouldn't. He was going to play cards at the Spieler in Kennington. Oh, which one? Tony Savilli's place. But he not play here? Not all night, I see him. But of course he couldn't have been here all night. He'd been murdered in the early hours of the morning, you know that. Now look, Senior Carr, I'm a respectable spieler. <laughs> oh, that's funny, a respectable spieler. <laughs> what do you think of that, Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> respectable spieler. Tony's judge. <laughs> what are you two trying to do? Give me the big frame up. He was here early on, wasn't he? Now, don't stall. He was seen well, he come by... here, yes. He come here, not to stay long, though. Did he play cards? No. Stay a while, and then he go. Do you know what the penalty is for withholding information? This is a murder inquiry, not a petty fogging visit under the Gaming Act. I'll tell you why he came here. He asked you to say that he was gambling in this joint, should his boss ask. But I... Uh... How you know? Did he or didn't he? See? It did. All right. Talk, Tony. Take it all down, Jackson. We'll get him decided. Tony's signed statement instilled in me the feeling that every detective waits for, the instinctive knowledge that at long last one is on the right track. I knew all along there was a girl in the case. Did you, sir? Why? Oh, never mind that now. Uh, yes? Operations here, Inspector. Yes. A 38 has been found by the LCC Refuse Department. They believe it came from one of the refuse bins in the Clapham area. Any joy? I don't know, sir. The registered number is... Well, never mind uh, that. Is it going to help us? I'm afraid not, sir. It's one of a consignment of guns stolen from Hunting and Fishing Limited, Dover Street, about two years ago. Hunting and Fishing? What are they doing selling pistols? I wouldn't know, sir. <laughs> I don't suppose you would. All right, Ops, thank you. Let me have it. If the number's on it, it's going to prove quite useful. But it's been stolen. I know, I know. Don't you worry about it. Send it over to the murder squad right away. Very good, sir. They found the gun, Jackson, as you know, I've gathered. Won't help us much, will it? Of course it will. It's going to be Exhibit A, as our legal friends would say. But I don't understand, sir. It was stolen from a reputable... But when? Two years ago. Now, where's it been since? And how did Mrs. Evans get hold of it? Mrs. Evans? You think she's the killer? I'll stake my non-existent bowler hat on it. I don't see why. I don't see why either. Not at the moment. Listen, Jackson. It all adds up. Why did Larry Ritchie tell his boss that he wouldn't be at the Cock and Sparrow because he was going to be busy at a spieler? That's number one. Two, why did he take the risk of involving Tony Savilli by asking him to act as cover-up unless there was some possibility that his boss might become suspicious? Suspicious of what? Mrs. Evans? Yes, Jackson. Mrs. Evans. Inspector... Now, I can understand Shimmy wanting to bub off Larry if Larry was too timing him with Mrs. Evans. But why you keep on the other... coming back to the motive. Now, this is one of the exceptions to the rule. This time we find the killer, and then we determine the motive. Fair enough, sir. What do we do? Pull him in for questioning? No, no, no. I want her trailed night and day. But she mustn't have the slightest inkling that we suspect her. She's a shrewd young woman. We haven't got a shred of proof. 
In fact, she's made one mistake so far, or perhaps two. What are they, sir? Well, for the moment, we'll concentrate on the second one. Being a woman, she didn't bother to file the number off the gun. She knew it was hot, and the chances of it being traced back to her were remote. Yeah. No, I still don't see it, sir. How can we trace it back to her? With the aid of her husband. You lied to me. Shimmy Evans, thug that you are, strong arm hoodlum and bully that you are, I believe you. Inspector, I can take so many insults and no more. What are you talking about? This I'm talking about. What? Pick it up, Shimmy. By the laws of the underworld, it's yours. Uh, what is this? What game are you playing? Remember that job in Dover Street, Hunting and Fishing Limited? Why didn't you file all the numbers? I'll tell you why. You flogged the rest, but you kept this one. Oh, I don't say you were going to do a murder with it. Otherwise, you'd have filed this one as well. Which of your gang did it? Who did you instruct to bump off Larry Ritchie? Me? You're crazy. He was a Palomar. Was he? Don't tell me you didn't know about Larry and your wife. Ah, uh, what? I've got an alibi. I don't care about your alibi. I'll break it. What did you say? What did you say about Larry and Mason? I was grateful for the change in the law which allowed a police officer to apprehend a suspect for 48 hours. It had to be either Evans or his wife. Could there be collusion between the two? In the eyes of the law, they'd both be guilty. I didn't think so. I had to take a high-handed action, as far as Shimmy Evans was concerned, in order to get some proof against his wife. Evening, Shimmy. I was expecting an outburst. None? <laughs> Were you? No, I've been thinking, Inspector, thinking about what you said about Larry and Maisie. What are you trying to do? I didn't kill Larry, you know it. Let me show you something. That's a signed statement by Tony Savilli. If you were to inquire from Tony, he was to say that Larry played cards at his speeder all night. Why the need for the cover-up? Amazing. Right, sir, Shimmy. Now, see my difficulty? We know that you had that gun. It was found in a refuse bin by the common. Ballistics say that there's a slight flaw which proves that the bullet that killed Larry came from Larry. Yeah, after all I did for him, and Maisie. Oh, no, I don't have to look at it. Why, oh, that dirty little trick. We well, have a strong motive, haven't we, Shane? No, I'm not that again, Inspector. I can Don't prove... say it. But what about Maisie? You know that this gun was in your possession. She could have taken it and used it on Larry. It's no go, Inspector. You heard what she said. She was asleep in bed when the shooting took place. You can't prove otherwise. You'd have pulled her in by now if you could. You'd better look elsewhere for your killer. Well, if she's innocent, you're guilty. You can't keep me here more than another day unless you've got a strong we'll case see. and you know it. We'll see. All right, Sergeant Jackson, let's go. Oh, let's hope it works. Think it will, sir? Shimmy knows the ropes, but he's pacing up and down that cell with a murderous rage. He hasn't had a chance to speak to his wife, but his sight of her expression of bland innocence is likely to trigger him off, and her. Anyway, let's hope so. Oh, uh, is this where she is? Uh, this is the office. Uh -huh. What have you done with my husband? You must be mad. No Where one's laid a hand on him, Mrs. Evans. A constable take Mrs. Evans to her husband. Very really good, sir. He's got a dozen witnesses. I advise you not to say anything, Mrs. Evans. You asked to see your husband. Can't he go along with this constable? You wait till I tell the papers shoving an innocent man in prison. Come along, madam. I'm coming. I'm coming. You're a rotten lot of... <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't think she approves of us. Sir. Breaks my heart. <laughs> All right, constable, get ready to switch on. Got the recording machine ready, Jackson? Yes, sir. Go through. Oh, darling. Darling, what have I done to you? What are you standing around for? I'm not a convicted criminal. All right, give you hell on. I'm going. Darling. Shut up, wait till he goes. Now, you see what you've done, you rotten little t Tommy. What are you talking about? shouldn't have done that, Shimmy. 
He shouldn't have hit me like that. You're not going to swing for the murder you committed. How long's it been going on? How many times did Larry make love to my wife? Why? You're you... wrong. You don't know what you're saying. Throwing that gun in a refuse bin. Didn't you know it was hot? Didn't you know the number had been filed? I'm not going to swing for the murder you committed, you slut. Shimmy, I... I had to kill him. He forced me. I didn't want to. And then he, he kept saying that if I didn't let him make wait, love to wait, me... Wait, 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 wait a minute. Why are they left us alone like this? Hey? What's that? They bugged the cell. That's it. Come on. Well, it's all here, sir. We played over the recording and she signed a confession. Well, she's no fool. It's likely to get her a recommendation for mercy. Still, it's just as well. It'll shorten the trial. It's worrying you, Jackson. Just this, sir. You said you knew the killer was a woman right from the beginning. How could you have done? I didn't say I knew. I said I was reasonably convinced. Although the clue stood out a mile. You see, Jack. Well, listeners, what was the clue? Simple, really. Not sure. Well, have you worked out why it was a reasonable assumption that Larry Ritchie was shot by a woman? Not sure. It was this. I doubt if the gun was more than an inch from the man's forehead. You see it now? How else could the killer get so close to the victim unless it was in a lover's embrace? The moral of the story? Girls, if you're being importuned by some gangster, don't go putting a bullet through his head on Clapham. It's so common. Good night. The Epic Casebook was produced by Michael Silver with Hugh Russ as Inspector Carr. Listen again next Thursday night at 9.30 to another exciting story from our Epic Casebook.